Hello, this is the Creation Gospel, and welcome back to the Spirit-Filled Family. We are continuing today um, now with the, the part of the series that deals with Spirit-Filled Wives. We've already covered Spirit-Filled Husbands, Spirit-Filled Children, as well as Spirit-Filled Singles. Now we're going to go on to the Spirit-Filled Wives, and you're probably going to notice some overlap in some of the, the foundational scriptures as it deals with the roles of husbands and wives. And in the last program, uh, what we did is we identified uh, the same way that we did for the men that it seems as though the writers of scripture are pointing out to husbands that they need to work harder on that on the spirit of knowledge, which is truly sacrificial love within a relationship. And with the wives in the last program, uh, we read from 1 Peter 3, 1, and we saw a pattern there in terms of the exhortations to the wives. So we're going to reread those texts right quick so we can remind ourselves what some of those important words were within the word clusters. What we're going to see is where Yerat Adonai, or the fear of Adonai, appears, there's going to be some other words that go within those clusters that uh, perhaps help us to understand more what it means uh, for a wife to reverence her husband. So let's read again. Peter says, in the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be one without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. So there's two of the words that we picked out, submissive and respectful. He goes on to say, Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair or wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. And so, as we're looking at some of the characteristics uh, of a wife who is exhibiting respectful behavior, those characteristics include being gentle and quiet. That quiet spirit, it doesn't say a silent spirit, but one in which it's very peaceful. He says, For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children, if you do what is right, without being frightened by any fear. Now, in, in the last program, we pointed out, you know, what exactly does it mean to be a child of Sarah? As, as we look how the scripture progresses to the book of Revelation, and in the end you have basically two women. You have the children of Sarah, um, basically the righteous from every nation, tribe, and tongue, but you also have the harlot. Um, it's interesting that the same Hebrew word, kedusha. It can mean holiness, or it can mean a prostitute. It depends on what your relation is in obedience to the word. And so he says, you know, look to Sarah as the example. And as we move through um, some of the material uh, toward the end of this segment on the Spirit-Filled Wives, uh, we're going to look more closely at Sarah and what it means to pattern ourselves after her. It's, it's called the double principle or the couple's principle, and um, her role within Abraham's life in terms of unity. And so one characteristic, it says that she submitted to Abraham, that she called him Lord. In other words, that title was a title of respect toward her husband. And he says, you've become her children, not the children of the harlot, 
but her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Well, ironically here, he's playing with the words. When he says, without being frightened by any fear, the same Hebrew word, yore, or yorat, especially yorat Adonai, the fear of Adonai, or the reverence of Adonai, that same Hebrew word can mean mo both negative terror type of fear, or simply respect. But he's telling wives, we don't want you to fear your husband. We don't want you to be in terror of your husband. We want you to manifest respect for your husband. Because remember, Paul was very clear about this uh, yoke, the partnership, the unity. Don't do this except by mutual agreement. And so there needs to be mutual respect but while for husbands, it's emphasizing sacrificial love within that relationship that's going to need special attention with wives, he's going to say it's actually respect where you're going to have to invest some extra energy. Because he says, I want you to do what is right without being frightened by any fear. In other words, it needs to be a voluntary rendering of respect, not because you're, you're afraid of ill consequences, not because you're afraid of the repercussions, but because you genuinely have that spirit of reverence within you for the Father, and therefore you're in turn rendering that reverence to your husband. And in Ephesians 5.21, it says, Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Now this is Paul writing again. He, he over and over emphasizes the mutuality. And so it's not as though he's saying husbands have no need to exhibit the spirit of reverence. But he's saying it starts with the reverence of Adonai, the Urat Adonai, and then it translates for Paul into the reverence of Mashiach. He says, the fear of Christ, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So which is it? Is the wife supposed to be subject to the husband? Or is the husband supposed to be subject to the wife? Yes. Whereas there's emphasis on respect for the wife, it is not necessarily de-emphasized for the husband because it's going to start, Paul says, with having that Yerat Adonai, that seventh spirit of the seven spirits of Adonai. Everything is founded on the basis of respect. So he says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. Here he's reminding husbands, it has to be about the sacrificial love, laying down your life daily for the sake of your wife, for the sake of your family. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. There's the sacrificial love again, the da'at. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. He says, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ, with reference to Mashiach, and the church. So he's speaking at two levels, spiritual and then physical. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. Again, emphasizing sacrificial love. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So, like I said, this is equal opportunity uh, in terms of what he's addressing. What is difficult for the husband, Paul and Peter are pointing out, it's very difficult for him to love her sacrificially. It's much easier for him to love her at that super level superficial level of the physical. He tends to see the, the food, the coverings, and the conjugal rights merely as something that occurs in the physical realm. But it also occurs in spiritual realms. And that's where that counterbalance comes in, where the wife is going to be 
uh, more aware of those three things in the spirit realm, the husband is going to be more aware of them in the physical. And that's why it says, you know, be subject to one another. The husband can't simply be satisfied with those three basic things. Hey, I've done these three things for you. I'm done. The wife reminds him, no, you're not done. Because these have to be engaged from the spirit. And where a wife may tend to emphasize or overemphasize things in the spirit realm at the expense of the physical, then the husband is there to keep her grounded and say, hey, it's not just a spiritual thing. It's also happening in the physical realm. And so together, these two tendencies, we bring those things together and we respect the position of the other, whatever that position is assigned. Now, it, it doesn't mean these are absolutes. There might be women out there who are more grounded in the physical level and men more at the spiritual level. But these, these are tendencies, and he says right here, I'm, I'm talking to you in a mysterious way, but I'm trying to explain this relationship to you. But the foundational thing for the wife that he's emphasizing here is respect. And so every day as we do our self-analysis in our relationship to our own husband, not anybody else's, I mean, it's, we don't, we're not saying to disrespect anyone else, but we say, who is worthy and who deserves and to whom am I obliged to render my greatest level of respect other than the Holy One? It's to my own husband. And so what you see is that the message is the same. Whether we're reading the words of Peter or we're reading the words of Paul, both of them are emphasizing to wives that reverence is a major component in the marriage. And that means that we give a high value to our husbands. What we don't want is for that reverence to turn into a negative expression. And by a negative expression, like I said, yirat Adonai, yoe. In Hebrew, it can mean terror or respect. When respect is directed properly, then it crowds out the terror aspect. What does it say? Perfect love casts out all fear. Fear in the negative sense. So that sacrificial love, love of the husband reassures the wife so that she can render him the proper respect and it's going to cast out all negative manifestations of fear in terms of terror and negativity. Now, if you think about, especially the United States, it seems like psychologists have a million words to describe fears of a million different things. There's all sorts of phobias out there. You've never seen so many phobias and things people are afraid of. But why is there so much negative aspect of fear? Why are we not seeing the more positive aspect, which is respect? Why are we not reverencing one another? Why are we not rendering respect to one another? Well, most likely because we have not rendered the proper reverence and respect to the Holy One. Because when you fail to render respect and reverence to the Holy One, the logical outgrowth of that is you will begin to develop the negative aspects of fear. It says in Isaiah 8, 12 through 13, You are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy. And you are not to fear what they fear, or be in dread of it. It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. Now that's pretty clear. Look around, and people are so caught up in conspiracy theories. I mean, if you want something to go viral on Facebook, put something on there about some conspiracy. 
But Isaiah is really clear. See, the conspiracy culture existed at as his time as well. I mean, there were all sorts of intrigues going on. And you can waste a lot of the energy of the day chasing conspiracies and neglecting the truth. You begin to have so much intimacy with falsehood that you neglect the intimacy with the truth. Because, see, if you truly respected the truth and reverenced the truth, that would be where you would direct your fear. That's where you would focus your time. You would sacrifice your time at that altar. You would render the Holy One that you know proper respect and say, you know what, I respect your word way more than another conspiracy book, way more than another conspiracy website. Because these things, they'll grow a new one every day. But Isaiah is clear. He says, you are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy. You are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. Because when you run around saying a conspiracy, a conspiracy, the word that you're sending out to people, the message that you're sending is, my God is not great enough. He's left me on my own to be terrified of all these forces around me. You know, the Antichrist in a cup of tea. Seriously? Is that what you're afraid of? Because what Isaiah is writing is that it is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. You want to be afraid of something? He says, why not be afraid of me? Because you can depend. If he becomes angry with you, it says it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. But you would rather be afraid of a conspiracy and take every day as precious, every hour of every day is precious, and every minute of every day is precious. Your days are numbered. He knows how many days you have. And can you imagine as your Father in Heaven how He's watching you waste your time chasing things that are not founded on His Word? Now, is it wrong to discern the times? No. Should you have a grasp of current events? Absolutely. But check your bookshelf. Check your bookmarks. What are you afraid of? Because you're sending the message. And in fact, the, the message here is the thing that you dread, the thing where you spend that time being afraid of it and saying, oh no, look at this conspiracy. He says, you're making it holy. He says, it's him you should regard as holy. The thing that you reverence, the thing that you respect, that is the thing that you make holy. If that is where you're spending your time on conspiracy theories, you're making them holy. And Isaiah says, don't do that. The Holy One, He should be your fear. He's the one you should make holy. He already is holy. The only question is, are you going to render that respect to Him and that holiness to Him? Let Him be what you're afraid of, because ultimately, you're not going to be judged by the conspiracy theory. You're going to be judged according to the words of His book. There's going to be a reflection, and we will have to account for all the idle time, and idle by, I mean meaningless, time that we spent chasing things over which we had no control and never would. But I can focus my time on His Word. I do have control over that. How much of His Word I want to study and absorb. It's His Word I want to make holy. It's His concerns I want to make my concerns. And see, that's what a, a wife, we can transfer this same principle where Isaiah is talking about the reverence that is due to the Holy One. That is foundational to every human being. But see, as wives, we can take this pattern and say, you know, where I spend my time 
those are the things I'm setting apart as holy. And my relationship to my husband, I don't want to turn into a negative aspect of fear. What I want to do is give him that proper respect to make him feel valued. And, you know, like we say, what you value, that's where you're going to spend your time. And so when you give him your attention in a positive way, he's going to feel that respect. Okay? And that's how we're actually increasing the holiness of our marriage. Because what we respectfully reverence is what we're making holy. We call it holy matrimony. Well, it's not merely at the physical level where we say it's holy because we're set apart from one for one another and not for the other. But where we spend our time, where we place our value in the marriage, that reveals what we are making holy. So it's not as though you're joined in holy matrimony one time. Your marriage should be holiness daily, hourly, by the minute. Are you lending more value to the marriage? Are you helping make this person better? See, you know, it says a, a godly wife is a gift from God, but so is a godly husband. Look around. That's a gift. And if we appreciate the value of that godly husband, then it's much easier to render that respect to him. You know, if, if we begin to inject negative fears into the way that we talk to our husbands, then it's that object of fear that we're making holy instead of our marriage. Now, do we still have to address problems? You bet. But it's the method of delivery that can make a huge difference between whether we're manifesting respect for him and his role within the marriage, or we're manifesting fear toward him that I don't think you can do the job. I don't think you're going to meet my expectations. I don't think you're doing enough. They feel that much more acutely than we think they do. And so that respect is foundational. And so the fullness of the Holy Spirit in a marriage, I think when we're talking about the wives, we have to say that it begins and it ends, just like it does on the menorah, because it's the seventh spirit of Adonai. It begins and it ends with being respectful of her husband. You should never hear yourself in public degrading your husband. Now, it doesn't mean you can't joke around, but you need to be really sure that the joke is mutually funny. Remember what Paul is saying? By mutual agreement, you do these things. You subject yourselves one to another. You submit one to another. So if the joke is not funny to him, it's not a joke. All right? It's disrespect. Right? You have to find out one another's boundaries. And sometimes that takes time and it takes mistakes. Maybe it, it means telling the wrong thing in public. And, you know, if he says that hurts my feelings, you know, or he might say it a different way. He might not say it that nicely. But when you feel like you're getting into a, a competition of telling humiliating things about one another, that's a really good sign that you've slipped into something disrespectful. And while it might be carrying on as a joke, it's actually very serious. Because now we're trying to level up the playing field here. You know, if you're going to disrespect me this way, then I can disrespect you this way. It's easy to get caught up in a competition and not step back for a moment and say, hey, you know what, I shouldn't have told that. You know, it was funny, but maybe it's one of those funny things that should be just between us. It is so anti-Torah, especially anti-spirit of the Torah, to publicly humiliate anyone, much less your husband. 
because this is the person who assigns the greatest value to you on this earth. And you don't want to sabotage that relationship by being disrespectful in your public speech toward him. Now, are you going to have some really honest conversations in the privacy of your own home? You bet. All right. Some couples, they actually enjoy arguing. And if that's not a stressful thing to you, if that's part of your personality, I'm not going to say don't do it. Some people really thrive on that. But most people, they're not going to see that as respectful on either end. And so we have to begin the day with respect, and we have to end the day with respect. And that means everything in between. Adonai is holy, so we should be holy. See, the husband consecrates the wife. That happens in the marriage ceremony. He makes her holy when he enters into that marriage covenant with her. And so we know that being set apart, being holy, which Adonai is pairing up thematically, being holy with what you reverence. So reverence is that necessary ingredient for a holy covenant relationship. Now, do husbands disrespect their wives in public? Sure, but that doesn't take away the responsibility for a wife to say, let me be really careful the words I speak in public and even in private, in our private conversations. Let me find out the threshold where when I deliver the message, where it might come across as disrespectful instead of helpful because my job is to be his helper my helper against him. So that means sometimes I'll disagree with him. In order to help him, I will have to disagree. But when I transmit that helping message disrespectfully, it's really not helping. And that's, it's kind of hard to, to get your mind around that, but that's how you learn and you grow with one another to find out what those boundaries are. What's acceptable to me and where is the line where I feel disrespected and it feels like the holiness of the marriage is being compromised? We'll continue after the break. Hey everybody, this is Daniel McGurr with Ancient Covenant Ministries and I'd like to have you consider donating to HRN because everything that goes on here is based basically off of your donations and not only does your donations help you able to watch these programs, but it also helps the message to go forth around the world and to allow other peoples to watch. So I ask you to consider donating your money to the station if you can and if you can't, that's fine too. But please consider donating to HRN. Thank you. Welcome back. Let's continue talking about reverence as being paired with the idea of holiness. Remember, we are still making our marriages holy when we give reverence. It's not that one-time thing. You know, in, in the giving of the ring in a Jewish marriage ceremony, the groom states, Harai at mekudeshet li betabat zu kadat Moshe v'Yisrael. And that translates to be made holy to me with this ring in accordance with the law of Moses and Israel. So when he gives that ring, that is his seal on the bride. And this is the Kiddushin segment of the marriage. The bride must consent to the groom's intent to consecrate her completely to himself. And the, the idea there is it has to be an action of consent. In other words, that segment cannot be completed unless the bride consents. She has to voluntarily enter into that marriage. She understands his intent to consecrate her completely to himself, and she has to be okay with that and enter in. If she has not voluntarily presented herself to be consecrated, if it's not by mutual consent, then Kiddushin is not present. 
and kiddushin means holiness. So by definition, holiness in a marriage is actually unity. We say, well, now holiness is being set apart. Yes, set apart in order to be gathered to like kind and like mind. Just like with the Mishkan, just like with the Mikdash, Israel is separated from the nations in order to be gathered to like kind and like mind. And then he can dwell among them. Well, it's the same thing with Kiddushin, with holiness. If the bride renders that voluntary consent to enter into the agreement, then this is lending holiness to that marriage. Mutual consent. And so if she consents, then she becomes his wife. If she consents, if she agrees, she must complete that declaration of holiness by giving that consent and her respect to him as the giver of holiness. That means she is going to receive all the terms of that covenant offer. She is in agreement. She is a willing partner. No one is holding a gun to her head. There's no adverse consequence if she backs out of the agreement. She's actually standing there in full agreement to all the terms. And this is part of making holy. Now contrast that with those who receive the seal or, or the mark of the beast in Revelation. Those with that seal of marriage or that mark on them, what that implies is they have willingly agreed to the beast covenant offer. And so they too have become holy. Remember what Isaiah said about what you reverence is what you make holy? But what they're doing, they are being set apart for him. They are being made holy to the beast. And they are a wicked bride. That's the story of Revelation. There are two brides. Remember, there's the harlot, there's the virtuous woman. They both have to go to the wilderness to be tested. So there is also holy matrimony going on, but it's consenting to holiness, the mutuality, the consent of the agreement with the beast. They've been set apart for him. And what they don't really realize is that they're not rendering respect, you're right, to the beast in that positive sense. Right? They are rendering it in its negative aspect. They are making the beast holy. It's not respect for Adonai. They are rendering reverence to the beast. Well, how can the beast be holy? Well, like we said, Kedusha, holiness, also means a prostitute. It's a contronym. It has a dual meaning. In the same way, a pagan priest in Scripture is also called a Kohen, just like a priest of Israel. So Hebrew words can hold the potential for dual expression. And so I'm saying with Uriah, you can get two completely different results depending on what you're respecting or what you're terrified of. That concept, the contronym that we're saying where there's two sides to the same word, um, other contronyms might be a, a contronym like shachar, dawn, shachor, black. Dawn is the first light, but it's also darkness. Um, Yichata. It means to cleanse from sin. Chata is sin. So it's depending on your relationship to the Devar you're going to have one of those two manifestations. We're saying the same thing about respect, ladies. Depending on how you are delivering or operating in that spirit of reverence, you're going to get one of two sides of the thing. 
you're either going to get that side of holiness or you're going to get a side that will eventually produce negative fears. So how do you give respect to this husband to whom you are holy and whom you want to make holy on a continuing basis? You know, like we said, it's not a one-time thing. Your continuing respect to him continues to assure him that you are consecrated to him in holy matrimony. Because at the moment you start fearing the mortgage, the car payment, what's happening to the kids in school, when the moment that you start rendering more fear to these things, than the reverence that is due your marriage and the value that is owed to him, to your husband, that's when you're going to have problems in the marriage. You have to figure out a way to deal with these valid concerns. The mortgage is a concern. The car payment is a concern. Problems with the children are a concern. But how I deliver that message, it can come across as I'm terrified of these things. Or it can come across as a respectful message. Um, and, and that was a, a story I think I told during the segment with the men. Is it's okay to tell your husband you're afraid. All right. But you have to be so careful because what he might hear is, I'm afraid because you're inadequate. You are not capable of helping me in this area with these legitimate fears. And so the delivery, the message, I think that is what is so critical. Um, the story I told, I think, to the husbands was I had gone to a seminar one time, and um, the teacher was telling a story about when he was first married he tended to drive a little too fast and a little too reckless, and his, his wife was constantly saying things to him when she was in the car with him, like, you need to slow down, and, you know, can't you see those brake lights in front of you, and you shouldn't slam on your brakes. You should, I mean, you should use your blinker if you're going to change lanes like that. And what he was hearing was disrespect, that she didn't think he was competent enough to drive his own car. That's what he was hearing. And he said, this went on for quite a while. And he said, one day, just to, to show her who was boss, I did something particularly risky. Now, it didn't cause a wreck, but he said, I just had this little, you know, shot of confidence that I showed her I was capable of doing this maneuver without causing a wreck because I was a skilled driver. And said, this time she didn't say what I expected her to say. I just assumed that she would go into a rant. And he said, instead, she just kind of looked down and she said very softly, it really scares me when you do that. And he said, it just dawned on me. I'd been an idiot all this time. I think I'm in a competition and she's being disrespectful. And the message she's trying to send me is I'm scaring her. And what kind of husband would I be if I intentionally scared my wife? And he said it made all the difference. But see, the difference in her delivery on that particular day was that she just very softly, remember what it said about that meek and quiet spirit? Sometimes the, measure, the message delivered softly is the one that penetrates much more effectively than the loud one or the scolding one. And so if you can transmit that message, it's okay to say, I, I really am scared. I'm scared about this situation. I'm so scared we won't have the money to make the mortgage payment if you go out and, and you buy this particular thing. A lot of arguments are about money. And sometimes you, you, you have to be more manly in the way that you express that fear. You have to be more analytical in transmitting it. Instead of transmitting the message emotionally, 
I mean, men think a little bit differently. It may be that you have to sit down and say, okay, on this side of the paper are all our expenses, minimum for the month. On this side of the paper is our income. You can see there's a problem here. We're spending more, we're obligated to more than we have coming in. And if you buy this brand new table saw, you're telling me that you can eventually save us money, but this month it's not going to save us anything. And so sometimes just looking at figures in back, black and white will make a difference. There's no need to be accusatory. It's no need to say it's just another toy, even though it might be. You know, he might have a whole stack of toys out in the garage. Because remember, he's a, he's a builder. You know, he's constantly directing that energy um, toward making things better. Remember the, the energy we talked about in the Spirit-Filled Husband? It's, it's wired into them, you know, because on them falls the obligation of the food, the coverings. And so they're constantly thinking of ways that they can do that. And if I had just this piece of equipment that I could save this kind of money, and if I had just this, then I could make more money. And they don't always subject it to the black and the white of income coming in, money going out. And so if you take the judgment out, I can't believe you've done this again. How could you have gone out and bought this? How could you put something else on the credit card? See that, that transmission right there? He's not going to hear another word. But it's setting up those, those key moments, those, for a child, we call them teachable moments. You know, there, it seems like there comes along opportunities and times where the ear is open. And we might talk about some of those times um, that his ear might be open to suggestion. But the second they're, they're hearing it as judgment, they're hearing disrespect, even though we don't feel like we're being disrespectful at all, we're being real. But now remember, they're made differently than we are. And what they're going to hear is sometimes different than what we intend. Because we do, we tend to have different ideas of what disrespect actually is. And to remind yourself of that, sometimes you need to go back and reread that passage in 1 Peter. It helps because it talks about submission. And we're going to talk about that word submission. What does it mean to submit to your husband? What does it mean in Ephesians 5 to submit? What are, what are Peter and Paul talking about? Submit to my husband because they said submit to each other, but then submit to him. What are they talking about? What are they trying to tell me? Well, if we look at that word for submission, and this is where it's going to help us to deliver the message properly so that we're limiting that negative aspect of fear and instead making it a positive aspect of respect in the message. I love you. I value you. And I want to build this home with you because you're a man, you're a person of great value in my life. And my job is to make you even more valuable when I give you back to Adonai. When you go back to the Father after I'm done with you, when your spirit returns to him, if Mashiach tarries, then I want you presented back to him in better shape than when I found you. That's our obligation as, as married people. Remember, to make happy. A happy person is productive. A happy person improves from day to day. Because a happy person, they're not going to have self-esteem issues. Because they know they're valued. And so learning how to make that person happy, you know, that's part of the formula. And so when we submit, you know, Often that means submitting our will, what I think will make him happy, to actually submitting to what will make him happy. And that's, that's part of it. I mean, we're not talking about violating the word in any way. We're talking about relational questions here. 
that have nothing to do with whether you're violating the Torah. It's personality problems. Remember, we've got that double list of priorities. Whereas the single, they don't have to consult anyone else on how they prioritize their day. But with a couple, we each have our list of priorities, and we've got to make those two lists into one list because we are one. And so sometimes my idea of what's best for you needs to be submitted to your idea of what makes you happy and what makes you feel valued in a marriage. And so if sometimes you feel like praising your husband or expressing his value in whatever way that makes him happy, if you feel like that's being disingenuous, then it's just a feeling. It's just the way that you feel. But if you know that's his gasoline, then pour it in the tank. I mean, it's cheap. I mean, it's really gasoline for free. If you know that he likes certain types of validation, if he likes verbal praise, if he likes a pat on the back, if he likes, you know, a sweet little text on the hour, that's cheap. It's not going to cost you anything, but it's going to increase his sense of value in your marriage. Find out what it is that he likes, not what you think he should. Of course, his job to do the same to you, but it has to be mutual. So how do we submit ourselves? I mean, how do we not read that passage and say, well, why are the wives always being told to submit? Well, they're not. We saw in context. It's mutual. But if it tells me to submit, it's not my job to ask how he should submit. It's my job to figure out what can I change. Because ultimately, the only person you can change is you. But the changes you make in yourself might actually affect someone's ability to change. And that's just like he said, they might observe your chaste and your quiet behavior, and it might actually be part of their transformation. So it's not forcing that other person to submit, it's learning how to be respectful and submit yourself and say, this is what my spouse thrives on. Right? I mean, it's, it's just like growing plants. If you know a, a certain plant likes uh, a fertilizer with a little more acid in it, then you put that certain type of fertilizer on that plant. But you don't pour battery acid on the plant. You figure out what makes the plant thrive. It's the same thing with verbal affirmation. Whatever makes your husband thrive, it might be verbal, it might be physical, then invest those things and he's going to feel his value is going up in your eyes. Where the truth is, you always valued him, but you weren't necessarily giving him the validation that he needed. You were giving the validation that you thought he needed. So find out what makes someone tick. So, let's go to this Greek word, it's Strong's number 5293, and it's submit is the English translation. What does it mean for a wife to submit to her husband? That Greek word is hupotasso, and the way that it's used in context in Scripture, it can mean to be put under, be subject to, or to submit one's self to. And these, these usage, they're, they're kind of spread out equally. You don't, you don't see any one of those uses kind of standing out as usually means this. So it's equally likely for it to mean not just to be put under, but to choose to put oneself under, which is what Yeshua basically said. You know, we are here to serve others. That we are, you know, we might have been brought out of Egypt. We might have been rescued from being slaves to Egypt. But that was because we voluntarily said we will do, we will hear. We voluntarily, remember what makes holy, subjected ourselves to be servants of Elohim. Now the actual definition of this word to submit 
It means to arrange under or subordinate. So I said, we find out what makes the other person tick and we submit to that, not what we think should make them tick. Two, it can mean to subject or to put into subjection. Three, to subject one's self or obey. We saw that in the, the usages and context where you, do, you say, you know, I voluntarily do this. Four, to submit to one's control. Say, okay, you're the boss. Five, to yield to one's admonition or advice. And six, to obey, to be subject. Now, it's also a Greek military term, the same word. That Greek military term means to arrange troop divisions in a military fashion under the command of a leader. In non-military use, it says it was a voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, assuming responsibility, and carrying a burden. And I think that clears up a lot of things for us because a lot of times, I mean, it's just like those passages that we read in, in 1 Corinthians 7. If we just pick a little verse out of its context, we can come away with a, a skewed view of what it actually means or what its significance might be. But if we look at things in context or if we look at how was it used historically in that period? What was it talking about? What we see is that with this word submission, the implication there, it's, it's a good attitude. It's a volunteer attitude. It's a cooperative attitude. Remember the two lists? We have to cooperate. It also means assuming responsibility and carrying a burden. So when I read submit, it's not telling me that my husband has absolute authority <clears throat> and he's basically excusing me from the battle. I mean, we're two soldiers and, and we're doing battle against the world, basically. That's the kind of that Greek military idea. And so the two of us are soldiers. And what it means is I'm going to cooperate and assume responsibility and to help him carry the burden. That's what it means. So it doesn't mean that he is excusing me from the equation. That would be taking the other ox out of the yoke, which doesn't make any sense in the complete context of Scripture in terms of how we do cooperate with one another. But remember what we said about the yoke. You might have two different oxen with different gifts. One might be stronger, one might be a little smarter, might walk a little straighter, might have a better ear for the commandments of the ox driver. But what it's saying is when, when it comes down to it, rather than start fighting the war against one another, it says, let's have a good attitude, let's cooperate, and as we assign the burdens in terms of the weight we're pulling, then let me submit myself and say there is another viewpoint. There is another ox in the yoke. And there will be times when you need to submit to the superior strength or maybe the better skill. You know, that's one thing in our marriage we find out is my husband has much greater technical skill. I'm the nerd. And so when we work together, if we're working on a technical problem, trying to figure out how to make WebEx work or something, then rather than insisting that I know what I'm doing, according to submission in this context, I need to have a voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, and assuming responsibility. And sometimes the best thing I can do is stand by and be available to help. Or sometimes the best thing I can do is go put my nose back in a book. 
And, you know, and if he needs help finding a source or something in a book, then I can be the one that can say, here it is. But it's that cooperative effort. That's what submission means. It means that you don't insist on having your way or insist that I know what you need. It says, let me give in. Let me choose to, not out of fear, not disrespectfully, not because I think something bad's going to happen, not because I'm being excused from the relationship in terms of decision making, but instead I'm going to cooperate. And that's how I'm going to help carry this responsibility responsibility and to help him carry the burden. Hope that makes sense in, in terms of context in this program. And we'll see you next time.